Today's guest on Life and a Living podcast is Jenny Davis, who is a business change specialist. Prior to actually starting her career as an entrepreneur and as a business change specialist, Jenny had an extraordinarily successful career as a sprint cyclist. She had the fastest woman in, in Scottish sprint cycling. She has represented her country uh, in the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow and also in uh, New Delhi. And she has a silver medal to her credit. So a fantastic elite athlete. And really interesting to listen to Jenny talk about what she takes from experiences being an elite athlete where that margin of difference is just so tiny, but is the t tiny bit that makes all the difference in terms of success and failure. And she talks about how she brings that into their world of working now with, with entrepreneurs and business leaders and what are the things that she really, you really need to focus in on. She talks a lot about, you know, really being clear about the small number of levers that are going to really impact. If you pull the right levers, you actually will get the right impact upon the success of your business and the tiny, tiny margin of success that you need to get on each one of those. But being really clear about what they are and also what success you're trying to achieve through those levers. The other thing is she talks a lot about is managing through change. And that is so relevant in the current climate that, that we live in. So really interesting, really interesting to hear what Jenny, who I said, has achieved the, the, the height of success in, uh, as an athlete and what she brings then to the, the business world and to entrepreneurs. And really, really an awful lot of great content in there. She also does give a, a lot of giveaways to, to the listeners here that you can get and that all of that information is in the recording and also in the show notes. If you want to listen to other great, great guests that we have, then go to the website www.johnmurphyinternational.com, hit the podcast tab and you will find loads Loads of great content there. But in the meantime, sit back and enjoy the conversation with Jenny Davis. Jenny, thank you so much indeed for being with us here on the Life and a Living podcast. It's a real honor to have you with us. Thanks, John. I'm a big fan of the show. I've been listening, listening for the last couple of months, so I'm really excited to, to talk to you and share some lessons with your well, listeners. Great. You have you've a lot to share. You, you're the, 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 the reputation as being the fastest woman in Scottish sprint cycling, which <laughs> is, is quite an achievement. I know that you've You've had uh, medals from the Commonwealth Games in, in, in Glasgow and also in Delhi. When you, when you look back on that and you kind of see, I mean, you've had huge success by any measurement in that field. What do you see that, that you bring into the work that you're doing now with Lions? What are you kind of feeding off on your memories and how you were trained, how you were coached, how you were guided, the success you had, the ma ma dealing with that success? How, what do you bring into the world now when you're actually dealing with your clients? Um, I think there's a few things. So uh, in both of the sporting worlds that I came from, there's, you know, I spent a lot of time working with world-class athletes, coaches, and all this, the massive support staff that, that um, supports them. And it gave me a real eye-opener about what it takes to be successful and to be unique and to be to be the best that you can be in that in your small little bit of the world and you know to take some of those lessons learned and apply it into the business it's exactly the same so for for most athletes what's really important is to understand for them to be better what their current state is what their measures look like and based on where they want to go, you backward engineer what you need to do to get there. Um, for a business, it's not going to be about time or how much weight you've lifted um, or something like the Olympics, which is really clearly defined for you. Um, for business, it's going to be things based on um, customer feedback, what they want and what they need. Um, what your profit and loss statement looks like and where you want that to go. And then having a really clear understanding of 
what you need to do, whether that's you're on the, the right track just now, or if you need to change and pivot that to be able to meet your goals in the future. Mm-hmm. So it's really about I help business owners and entrepreneurs understand um, what they want, long term, middle term, short term, um, where they are just now. And then we work through all the different options and focus on the really, really important ones that will get them there as quickly yeah. as possible. Uh, wait, and when you just go back to your sporting career, I mean, you were at that kind of world class level. And when you think of athletes like you that were at that world class level, the, the, the guys and the girls who are kind of below you in the, the next kind of, I mean, they're not a, a million miles away. I mean, it's not as if they're kind of minutes back in terms of sprinting around. So what is that kind of that ingredient that just is the difference between the world class and the really good? Um, I think attention to detail is very important. And and that is holistically across everything that can impact your performance and your results. And also understanding what are the most important things that will help you get there. So a really good example, um, Chris Hoy's first Olympic gold medal. Um, now that would have been before Beijing. So Athens, one event um, that he was last rider up the person who rode before him broke the world record for that event. He was last up and he won that Olympic gold medal by one one hundredths mm. of a second. And that was the launch pad for him becoming Britain's most successful Olympian of all time to, to date, yeah. um, where he ended up with five or six gold medals. And it was one one hundredth of a second. And I I don't doubt on the day that was a decade worth of every single day him trying to just eat into the improvements and and having faith that everything that he was doing and the work that he was putting in was the right things and that the results would come. Mm-hmm. But British yep. people are famous for their attention to detail across every single thing that can impact your performance. But is, isn't that the important piece to, to an extent, or is it the important piece, I should say, as a question, that it's, you said, the impact, all the things that impact the performance, that they really know what are their levers that are going to give them that tiny, tiny bit. Because you, know, you talk about the time, you know, hunters say, I mean, you can't even blink at that with that, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, it's attention to detail across a number of things, but they're the right things that you're focusing in on to get that marginal difference. The other question, which, which I think is really very applicable to business, is actually being really clear about what are the right things. And, and, and I, I kind of try and do that and focus in on that with my clients. The other thing which I think is interesting, when you look like, you know, athletes like yourself or Chris Hoy, you take, since you mentioned Chris Hoy there, okay, he got through and he beat the world champion. It was by the tiniest of margins. But does that actually, does that then give you the mindset that you know you can do it? Because to continue on and build on from that, how much of that is, is mental as much as physical? Um, a, a great deal in it. I think it can be the difference between um, being in the final of an Olympic Games and not, being in the top eight and being in the final round of the, and not quite often at that level, genetically and physically, athletes can be very similar. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how they deal with the upstairs and the coping strategies that they have. And, you know, none of them or I ever learned how to do that ourselves. We had support. We had psychologists and people that specialized in distraction control. And you, you do it as part of your training all the time. So mm. I knew at Glasgow Commonwealth Games that the the stands would be packed, that people would be singing the national anthem, which is very emotional for me, and that my parents and my family and my loved ones would be in the audience. And that was all brilliant, but there are massive distractions when, you, when you're trying to focus and and deliver on something that might take you 11.5 seconds. 
And one of the ways that I prepared for that was there was an international racing event down in London a few months before the Commonwealth Games that was a sellout. And I did did some cycling events there that I don't normally choose to race in. But I went I went down and did some endurance events to allow me to experience what a a packed velodrome full of fifteen to twenty thousand people feels like and sounds like. And it, it meant when it came to experiencing that in Glasgow, I'd already done it. I knew mm. I could handle it. So it's much about practicing and testing and experimenting as it is. And then that helps build your confidence mm. and and helps. I mean, I, I think for Chris in his first Olympics where he won that gold, I'm pretty sure that gave him a massive confidence boost. Right. Yeah. And, you know, he had the, the rug pulled underneath him the following year because his Olympic medal event got removed and they added in three completely different sprint events that he typically didn't race in before but it didn't stop him he had faith and confidence in his abilities and went for it but you know it it, it is interesting what you're saying there you talk about Glasgow I mean okay you're in your I was gonna say your home city actually Edinburgh is your home city but you're in your home country and people say oh you've got an advantage because your home country and you've got all the fans and everybody's behind you and yes, that's true. But also the other side, as you say, it's massive pressure. And very often in that environment, people kind of crumble with the pressure and it's the ability to manage the pressure. So when you bring that back in now into the work that you're doing, you know, with with businesses and you're a business change specialist, when you're working with a, what do you bring of that? And just that's kind of one part of the question as well. The second part of the question is, for you coming out of that, because you said, okay, you were surrounded by coaches and psychologists and everything, and then suddenly you stop and you go out and you say, hey, now I'm actually an entrepreneur, I'm on my own, and you look around and it's kind of terribly devoid of people who were <laughs> all were there before you to kind of bow to every whim and need that you might have had, and now you've got to suddenly do it for yourself. So starting with yourself, how did you cope with that? And then how did you bring that kind of extra little bit that it takes to be the champion as you were and Chris Hoy was. How do you bring that into business? Maybe you start with yourself when you start on your own. Um, I think, it, so I'm, I mentioned this a little bit later on, but m- my view in life is no one succeeds alone. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't, like, I've never met a person, I've never heard of anyone that, um, that's had any success in their own little bit of the world that does it alone. And I, one of the lessons that I learned from my sporting career far too late on was I thought I could do it myself and that I would be picked on merit and, and how my results, how my results went, but getting feedback and guidance from others and support meant that I had the successes that I did and I wouldn't have had them if I didn't have support. So when I moved into supporting business leaders and and other entrepreneurs you know for them they they need to also use their little mini board of directors and and mentors and guides um to try and help them because i think um the the world's a big place it can be very lonely when you're running your own business and um entrepreneurs are a special breed your your life is like a bit of a roller coaster and sometimes people who've been permanently employed find it really difficult to understand because it's quite stable for them if they've got a stable job so i think my advice from what i took from my sporting days through hard lessons was don't do it alone and find people to support you and offer guidance and um, that was the quickest way to my success in business as well was finding people in my wider network and helping them and offering value. And then um, when I needed when I needed some support, they've been able to do the same. So I think that's my number one tip. And they will always help you make decisions about what is the most important thing that will have the biggest impact on your success. 
because we only have a very limited amount of time and energy. So you've got to be really, really careful and focused and make sure that where you're putting that is, is the right mm -hmm. thing for you to succeed. Yeah. I mean, I know one of the things that you do uh, in your business is, you know, helping uh, business leaders, business uh, entrepreneurs, business owners to how to lead through a time of crisis. Well, dear God, we couldn't have come through much more of a crisis than we are in the middle of right now. Yeah. So how are you helping your leaders, your clients to kind of navigate through all of the challenges that the COVID is bringing to them? Sure, good question. Um, there's a couple of bits. So I guess for lots of people all over, um, the the masses the mass of change and that might be jobs it might be linked to what's going on with health or your wider family um just coping with lockdown with kids while you're trying to work um all those things are massive changes for people and um there's a really famous model called the kubler ross model which um talks about there being five phases that people potentially go through when they're moving through change, um, shock and denial, uh, anger, bargaining, um, depression or sadness and acceptance. And I think for leaders that have people in their teams where there's lots of change happening and some of it's not been expected or it's negative for them, it's really important to understand where people are in each of those phases. And there are certain things that you can do to help people in each of those phases to make sure that what they feel doesn't go really deep um, and shortens the length of time that they're in that. And there are certain things that you can do if, if you say or do something wrong in that phase, it can actually make things worse. Yeah. So um having helping entrepreneurs understand which phase they and their people are in and then giving giving them some guidance and support around what you can do to help somebody that's maybe in shock um versus you know the strategies are different for somebody that's okay. very and when way. when you look at people i mean one of the things that that i you know you come across a lot in the current climate is that people you know, working from home, which can be, you know, challenging. It, it, it can be great as well. But one of the big challenges has been where, you know, they've got young children. So they're confined to the house. Um, maybe, you know, both parties are, are working and they're trying to homeschool, mm -hmm. which is a bit like trying to juggle the impossible. So, you know, what advice do you give to 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 leaders that you're working with how do they how do they support their people through that challenge and through that difficulty mm -hmm. I, th I think the main thing is to try and build some flexibility and to be really open and honest again what is current state what is happening for for me i've got a dog that won't leave me alone i've got two kids um, and i've got a full-time job mm. and my partner was furloughed but they've gone back to work now. Right. Um, you know, that's that's a picture that could potentially change week on week. So um, people that have others in their team needs to make sure that they they understand what's happening, what's the reality for that person and what can be flexed. So I know uh, I've got some friends um, where they've changed the the hours that they work so that there's a bit more crossover and they've got somebody there that can do schooling or looking after the kids if they're younger mm -hmm. um and there's just you know in times like this humor is really important and we we had i had a call just before this and one of the girls that was on our call said um she's got a special guest for the call and her daughter was in the background and she had the headset on and we all said hello yeah. and you know it totally made her day um but i think because we acknowledged it and acknowledged her daughter and then when she turned and explained to her daughter you know mommy's busy um it's really important that i have some quiet time and then she gave her daughter a task to, to go right. and do the next mm -hmm. half an hour so um, I think talking about a uh, um, bit of humour, being open and honest about 
the challenges that you're facing. You don't need to do it alone. Yeah. Um, there's people around you. They might not be able to physically be there, but if you can talk it out, um, you know, that that's just through one conversation. I've shared one little story about Heather and her daughter yeah. um, and how she included her daughter for a few minutes, which helped her daughter understand why she needed to be quiet and I, I probably helped the other people on the call as well that it was just natural so it probably is, it was good for everybody I, kn I know that one of the things that you're you're very kind of uh hot on is is kind of helping people not to spend their life kind of firefighting and reacting and responding what and and i think that at the moment because of what's going on there's a kind of the tendency just to kind of keep on just putting out fires how do you draw people back from that and get them to kind of focus on the things that really matter? Um, there, there's two parts to it. There's the bit that they need and the bit that they want. So um, for somebody that's firefighting and, you know, their business or maybe their personal life's a bit chaotic and they're working lots of hours and maybe there's other parts of their life are suffering. Um, usually being able to find some quick hits and create some time for them and solve some of the problems that's causing the fires is kind of phase one. And then um, once that time and some of the fires have died down a little bit, phase two is the time that's been saved, we reinvest in taking a step back of taking a step back from the situation in their life and their business and having a really having really good conversations about what they what they actually want mm -hmm. um, what's most important to them and what do we need to do to get them to get them there and then and then from then on it's a bit of a journey depending on lots of different factors mm -hmm. um, so it's a mix I help people solve some of their business problems and help create some time and then rather than them using that free time to do more emails or go on facebook or lose it in non-value added activity if i if i help them save two hours a day we protect that two hours and we use it to make some really really good decisions about what they want to do and and then we do it yeah and that's actually giving some balance and some that they're that they're not just focusing on their business life, but they're also focusing on their their their, their broader life. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that you've lived through is the kind of the, the if you look at British cycling, because British cycling kind of transformed from being a kind of a no hoper, maybe that's a bit unfair, but certainly not a high achiever, to being <laughs> you know absolutely at the, at the top of it. Can you talk a bit about kind of what was it that created that transformation? Because I think that's that's pretty fair to say, isn't it? What I've just said is pretty fair to say. Um, mm -hmm. And what was it that caused that transformation? And and if you look at you know a lot of business people, I'm just trying to draw parallels. That a lot of people are in businesses that, you know, not quite as, perhaps in the situation that British Cycling was, but they're in a, a very very challenging situation. Firstly, the, the British cycling, and then how do you apply that to businesses that are maybe saying, where do I go to from here? Yeah, sure. They're, the lessons from British cycling are completely intertwined with businesses that are in a similar state. Um, British cycling, there's a couple of bits. They had a chairman and board who decided that they didn't want to be the laughing stock of the cycling world anymore. Um, so your assessment was very true. The only main successes they had tended to be outliers. So people like Chris Boardman, no, known as the scientist, and uh, Graham Aubrey, um, you know, who who was very, very, he's a very innovative guy who um, famously built his bike out of parts from washing machines and things like that. <laughs> right, uh... so, um, Eccentric might be a word that you would use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and he would sit here and say that exactly the self himself. Um, so they decided they didn't want to be laughing stock. They wanted to be the number one team on the track, on the road. Um, so they were really clear about what they wanted. They got clear about 
um, their timelines. So for Olympics and World Championships, your timelines are defined, so it makes it much easier to plan. And they just backward engineered what they needed to do. So they got really clear on what they wanted, what would get them there in terms of, at that time, lottery funding had only just become a thing. And they, you know, it wasn't millions and millions and millions like they get now. So they had to, the limited amount of time and energy and money that they had, they had to invest in the places that would give them their biggest bang for their buck. So it was goals, uh, vision and goals, um, really clear on priorities, which is kind of like your 80 20s. Mm. So, what are the small amount of things that will give you the biggest bang for your buck, the 80% of gains? And then they're most famously known for their marginal gains principle, yes. which is where you might have a hundred things that can improve a, an athlete's performance. And if you improve each little thing by 1% or half a percent, when you bulk them all back together with compound effect, you get a much bigger win. Um, so, and that's where the attention to detail for them comes, comes through, through their marginal gains. So I think those three or four things are what, or what was the difference for them? And their 80 20s were things like they recruited the right people to get them. So they were really ruthless about who they wanted, experts in their industry and cross industry. They, they have a, a, a group of marginal gains experts that are not cyclists who come from you know, swimming in the military and different um, Formula One experts that they work with. And they use these people and they do lots of tests and, and experiments. In the wind tunnels, they've got lots of measures that allow them to see um, the, this new piece of equipment, whether it gives them gains or not. Um, and they're just ruthless about applying all of those so attention to detail isn't it interesting though when you when you actually take all of that that you said because uh, you know you talked about okay really clear about the vision i've been passionate about the vision uh really clear about you know what does success look like um you know what is it so how do we know when we get there really success about what are the milestones really so uh, really clear about what are the stepping stones to achieve those milestones um and then you're getting the right people in. So you've got the right people, you know, in the right roles, doing the right work in the right way. Mm -hmm. And all of those are absolutely transferable to the business world, isn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, and it is also that kind of concept, you know, if you like the marginal gain, it's, it's kind of the Kaizen approach, and, but it is that kind of marginal gain, but also a mentality that we're always testing. We're always trying new things. Mm -hmm. It's never being that, okay, we got there, right? Or we're not trying. It, it is about that bringing that kind of day one. I think one of the things that I found interesting in when talking to people in Amazon, that their mentality is it's day one. So mm -hmm. day one, be innovative, be creative, be agile, be flexible. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's exactly what you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, you've got, you've got to be. Um, you know, the world of sport and Olympics is is a ruthless place that leaves no, no place for prisoners. And there's these governing bodies that their funding and the legacy that they want to leave for the British public um, is all based on funding and funding yeah. based on results. Mm -hmm. So um, their, their motivation for it's really clear. I think motivation and business can be different and that's down to the business owner guide in that direction and being really clear about what's important and having the right people and processes and technology to support that yeah. and having measures in place all the time um, to help know where you are mm. across your market. But I think it's also interesting what you're saying about bringing resources in from not not just staying within your lane of you know in this case cycling, but you were looking at 
you know, probably different sports. We mentioned Formula One. I'm sure there were other things that came in the whole psychology side. You know, all the different sk- things that you bring to bear. So it's the non-traditional way of doing things and the non-traditional resources. And that's mm-hmm. actually what separated. And of course, they had great success. Jenny, this is really, it's been fascinating. Before we kind of wrap up, you can tell people where they can get in touch with you. Two questions for everybody. One is a book that you've read that has had a big impact upon you, what it is and what the impact it had. Sure. Um, similar theme to what we've talked about. There's a book called The One Thing. Oh, yeah. It's Great a book. big, big uh, little yellow one. Um, it's not, wouldn't take people long to learn, to read through. Um, that taught me, you know, through my teens and 20s, I loved to try and, think that I had great balance in my life and I think I spread myself too thin and I think I would have had more success if I'd sat down and thought about what I really wanted and what were the small number of things that would get me to where I wanted to go. So the one thing that helped helped with the mindset and has helped me be a lot more laser focused about here's here's what I want to achieve. And I have 50 things that could help me do that. And, but there will be one or two things in that 50 list that will be the small thing that will give me the biggest bang for my buck. And that book helped me, help teach me how to do that. And then Mm. now I help other people. That's a great book. I'll say, I agree with you. It's a fantastic book. Second question, daily rituals. I'm sure with your background that you have them. Um, what are they and what do they help you do? Um, so I've got a, a couple of main ones, um, probably two related to teams and then a third one more just from a personal point of view. So um, the first one is related to the book. So I am really clear about what my priorities are first thing in the morning. Um, what are the eat my frog, the thing that I'm maybe putting off that I really need to do to to make the biggest impact um, for for the people that I support. So getting really clear on my priorities, um, making sure that I'm keeping good connections and good relationships with those that are in my wider network. No one does it alone. I know I said that earlier, but it is very much true. And I think that's really important. It may not be a daily habit, but you know, of all the people that you might know and you want to keep in touch with, it's good to do that. And then my third one, because I'm big on health and fitness, I always leave time every day to do um, some kind of health and fitness session. So, and that's a a mix of um, obviously being out on the bike, circuits, maybe a bit of yoga if I'm looking to do more recovery and restorative work. But that keeps me physically mentally and emotionally in a good place are you still close to your fastest woman time um that's an unfair question to ask <laughs> <laughs> i would say i'm not sure i'd i'd probably need a couple of months to train so I'm not been on the velodrome for a while and speed on the velodrome is an interesting one it you don't get it linearly you got to like do lots of strength work and then you plug in speed at the end. And then if you have faith that comes along, hopefully at the right time. Um, but I do have, uh, I do hit similar or um, more go over my markers for some of my other health and fitness indicators. So fantastic. Well done, Jenny. It's been a real pleasure. Where can people get in touch with you? We'll put all the information in the show notes, but if they're listening now, where can they get in touch with you? So I created a page on my website, which is www.strivechange.org forward slash win VIP. And uh, I've got an email and video series called um, Sports Lessons Applied to Business, um, which your listeners are more than welcome to access. Um, I've built a, like a, a little special content part just for your listeners about winning teams in that as well. So it's www.strivechange.org forward slash win VIP because I know they're very special 
dialing in and listening to. Yeah, very good. Believe you me, they will take advantage of that. Jenny, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a real pleasure and I look forward to doing it again sometime soon. Great. Thanks, John. Lovely to meet you. Take care.